really hope that today this hymn becomes so real and practical to us. Uh, I'm really happy to be here again to speak to you on this series of messages on the life and letters of the Apostle Paul. And we hope that you've been enjoying all the messages so far. This is the fifth message. Uh, we hope that you've been enjoying them either here on campus or on our Facebook page. And if you weren't aware, actually at the bottom of the verse sheet is a Facebook address. Uh, these messages each week are videotaped and put online. So if you miss a message and you want to see it, or if you enjoyed a message and you want to see it again, you can log on to our Facebook page just a couple of days uh, probably by Tuesday, somewhere around there, the messages go up, so you can hear them again. But uh, just to begin, I want to go back to last week. And the title of the message last week was, Who Are You, Lord? And this was a question uh, that the Apostle, well, that this is a question that Saul asked when he was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. So the question was, who, uh, the, actually, what he heard was the Lord asking him a question first. And this question was, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And we have to consider what Saul must have been thinking at this point. He had never persecuted anyone in heaven. He had never been there. He was persecuting these people, these Christians on this earth, who he considered were heretics. But still the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who is this me? And so Saul responded, and he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord answered this question, and he said, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. Uh, a number of things must have been going through his mind at this time. But I'm sure at least two things. One of them being that the very God of this universe, the very God of his forefathers, was Jesus, the man who died on the cross and who people were saying had resurrected. This is God. And the second thing, <clears throat> that this Jesus is not only far away from us in the heavens, but He is here on this earth in all of the many members of His body. You know, the illustration was given, if you were to kick my leg, my response would be, why are you kicking me? Because my leg is not separate from me. It's one body. And this is the vision that the Apostle Paul, for the rest of his ministry, spoke about. About Christ being the head and his body being the church. And we can see this clearly in verses like Ephesians 1, and 23, which say, And he gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. We'll get more into this in the coming weeks. But the conversation didn't end there. This conversation that we've been going on, uh, going over for the last few weeks, didn't end there. Saul continued and asked another question. And this question is the title of today's message. So let's read the title today at the top of your sheet under message 5. Let's read this with a real exercise, okay? What shall I do, Lord? Now this title comes from Acts 22.10, which is the first verse on our verse sheet. It may be true that many people have never asked this question in their entire life. But here you have a man who for the first time in his life declared Jesus as Lord. And for the first time in his life asked this question, What shall I do, Lord? You know, uh, Saul was very capable 
as we've seen in the previous messages. He could do many things on his own. But here he asks, What shall I do, Lord? This was his falling down. Falling from his zeal. Falling from his works. Falling from his self-righteousness. Falling from anything that he thought he knew. And he asked this question, What shall I do, Lord? You know, many of us in this room, before we were saved, we did everything according to our will. And we were very capable of doing things on our own. But one day, after seeing what the Lord Jesus had done, we also realized that we don't know everything. And that there's one who is higher than us in this universe. For this reason, the first question a believer should ask after they're saved is, What shall I do, Lord? When making our decisions, when choosing our future paths, and when even getting into any kind of Christian work, we need to ask this question, What shall I do, Lord? There should be one desire in our heart. What shall I do, Lord? Well, after Saul asked this question, the Lord responded and later gave him a divine commission, which we'll see in the coming verses. Let's first get into the first group of verses on our verse sheet, Acts 26, 16 through 17, to see the response to this question. Go. Rise up and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a minister and a witness, both of the things in which you have seen me, and of the things in which I will appear to you, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles, to whom I send you. So we can see here that Paul was, was or Saul was appointed. Uh, a, a minister and a witness. Now, a minister or the ministry is related to what he would do. But a witness was related to who he was. And I just want to focus on this word witness for a moment here. What is a witness? Actually, <clears throat> I went to dictionary.com to look up the definitions for this word. And there were some really good definitions. I'll read them to you. A witness is an individual who, being present, personally sees or perceives a thing, a beholder, a spectator, an eyewitness, and a person who gives a testimony. You see, a witness is not someone who knows everything and has all the right answers. A witness is someone who has seen something and then begins to tell others about what they've seen. Maybe you've been in a situation in your past where you were nervous to speak to your friends about the Lord Jesus because you felt you didn't know what to say. Maybe you felt you didn't know the Bible well enough. Or... Maybe you are hanging out with some friends who began to speak negatively about Jesus Christ. And you didn't want to jump in because you might not have the answers to answer them when they start asking questions. I'm not saying that we shouldn't know the Bible. We should. And as we grow and as we read the Bible, we'll know more. But the Lord is, does not need know-it-alls. He needs witnesses. Those who have seen something and speak according to what they've seen. I believe that all of us have seen something. If not, we wouldn't be here today. We've all experienced something. If not, we wouldn't have believed into the Lord Jesus at some point in our life. Maybe when your friends ask you a question... You can just say, I don't know. 
You know, it's okay to say, I don't know. But I do know this. And then you can begin to share your testimony. What you heard that caused you to believe in the Lord Jesus. Or what you experienced and heard at a meeting. Or the care that you felt from other Christians and other believers. We don't have to have all the right answers, but the Lord desires ones who have seen something to speak concerning what they've seen. So Paul was appointed a minister and a witness. But if we continue here with the verses on our sheet to verse 18, which actually is a continuation from verse 16 and 17, in this verse we have the divine commission. Uh, this verse shows us Paul's commission. So let's read this verse together now. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the authority of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity. So here we have Paul's commission. <clears throat> which is to turn people from darkness to light, from the authority of Satan to God so that they can know forgiveness of sins and be brought back to their inheritance with all, the, with all of those, the sanctified ones, the saints, the other believers. You know, this matter of opening people's eyes and turning them or releasing them from the bondage, the authority, and the oppression of Satan is the gospel that Jesus Christ spoke when he was on this earth. And which is recorded in Luke chapter 4. This is the next verses on our verse sheet. Let's read Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19 together. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me So here the Lord Jesus said he was anointed and he came to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and send away and release those who are oppressed. So we can see that in Acts 26, Paul was commissioned with the same work. The Lord was continuing his work now through Paul. But I want to focus on a few words at the end of these verses here. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee. What is the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee? The Old Testament of the Bible tells us the story of God's people, the children of Israel, who were brought into the land of Canaan, which was called the good land, a land that was to be flowing with milk and honey. And when each family entered into the land, each family was given an inheritance, a portion of the land that they were to work on in order to eat and live. But some of them became lazy. And they stopped working on their land. Because of this, they became poor and ended up having to sell their inheritance, to sell their <coughs> land. Some even <coughs> continued deeper into poverty and had to sell themselves as slaves to someone else. Imagine the situation. You've lost everything. You've lost your freedom. Now you're in bondage. You're a slave to someone else. You've lost your inheritance, your portion of the land. And you've also lost your family by being separated from them now that you're a slave to someone else. But in the 50th year, 
Every 50 years, it would be a jubilee year. And what would happen is, they would sound a ram's horn throughout all of the land and proclaim liberty to all those who are under slavery. Imagine the atmosphere. You've lost everything. And then you hear a ram's horn. And you realize that you're going to be free again. The next verses on our verse sheet come from Leviticus chapter 25. And these verses illustrate the year of the Jubilee to us. Let's read this together. And you shall count off seven Sabbaths of the year to your seven times seven years, so that you have the time of seven Sabbaths of years, that is, forty-nine years, which you shall count off from the time of the Passover in the seventh month, all the day of the month, and the tenth day of the month, from the day of expiation, you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your life. In the Jubilee, in this year, every man was freed from slavery, liberated from slavery. They also received back their inheritance, their portion of the land, and they were returned to their family, to be with their family again. Brothers and sisters, this is a picture of mankind. Everyone has lost everything. Man is sold under sin and under the authority of Satan. Romans 9.14 on our verse sheet says, I am fleshy, sold under sin. This is man's condition. Man has lost their portion of the enjoyment of God himself and been separated from their true family, the church. This is the condition of mankind, under the authority of darkness and in bondage. But in Luke chapter 4, we have the reality of the Jubilee. The Lord Jesus has come, and He died on the cross so that we can be forgiven of our sins. To break everything that bound us. To release us from the slavery of sin and Satan. To bring us back to God. To enjoy our inheritance. And to bring us back to the church. Where we can be in fellowship with our true family. And we can see this thought in Colossians 1, 12 through 14, which is on our verse sheet. So let's read this verse now. Colossians 1. 12 through 14. In giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you for a share of the allotted portion of the saints in the light, who delivered us out of the authority of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You know, uh, this verse, Colossians 1, 12 through 14, really corresponds with Acts 26, 18, Paul's commission. Both of these verses speak of darkness, light, authority, in the negative sense, forgiveness of sins, those who are sanctified, and, or saints, uh, saints means the sanctified ones, and they all speak about the portion or inheritance. For sure, when Paul was writing Colossians 1, 12 through 14, he was remembering his commission that was given to him at his conversion. So here we can see that Paul was appointed 
a minister and a witness to proclaim to everyone the Jubilee. Listen, we don't have to wait 50 years anymore. The Lord has finished all the work. Now when any man believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and receives and accepts Him as their Savior, they are freed from the bondage. You know the hymn that we sang today in the first section says, When Jesus broke my fetters in twain. A fetter is a shackle for the feet. It's those shackles that don't allow a prisoner to take wide strides. Jesus broke the fetters in two. When any man believes into the Lord, he breaks their fetters. He brings them out of the darkness, out of the authority of darkness, out of the authority of Satan into God. He brings them back to God and back to their family, the church. So this is Paul's commission. But what about you and I? You know, Paul's no longer here physically on this earth to go from place to place and proclaim the Jubilee. Of course, we have the Bible, of which he wrote 14 of the books of the New Testament. But I believe that many of your friends have never read the Bible. I believe that many of your family members don't own a Bible. I believe that many of your classmates have never heard the ram's horn being blown. Paul is no longer physically here, but you and I are here. We too have been commissioned to sound the ram's horn, to proclaim the year of the Jubilee. And we can see this in 1 Peter 2.9, which is the second to last verse on our verse sheet. Let's read this verse together now. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people acquired for a possession, so that you may tell out the virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but you were the people of God, you were the people of God. We have been commissioned to tell out the virtues of Him who has called us out of the darkness and into His marvelous light. Out of the oppression, the slavery, and the authority of Satan and into the kingdom of the Son of His love. So what should our response to this be? Well, Paul's response to this is the last verse on our verse sheet. And it says this, Therefore, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I hope that each one of us in this room would ask this question. What shall I do, Lord? And that the Lord would give us a heavenly vision concerning who He is, concerning what He has done, all of His accomplishments, and concerning what is on His heart today. And that we too would be obedient to this vision. That we would help those who are around us to come out of the darkness and into the light. Out of the authority of Satan and to God. You may be considering someone you know right now who is under the authority of darkness. We would help those come to God to experience the forgiveness of their sins. To come back to their inheritance, their lost portion their enjoyment of God, and help them to enjoy God with all the other believers, the church, with all of the sanctified ones, the saints. So this is our commission. We've been given the commission to sound the ram's horn. Uh, I hope all of us could 
speak this line that Paul spoke in Acts 26, 19. Therefore, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. 